You guys ready to go? Okay, good evening everyone. We apologize for being a little late. We're trying to be sure that our, our translator works okay. Um, we're calling our special meeting to order um, and we have a roll call um, by our city clerk, Kathy Valdez. The record shall reflect that all members are present. Okay, the next day we're gonna have a Pledge of Allegiance and that's gonna be led by Council Member Green. So please rise for that. Okay, tonight we're having a public hearing about proposed district boundaries by, for by district elections. So we're gonna open our, the public hearing and then we're gonna conduct and close the public hearing to consider proposed district boundaries for by district elections for the city council. So the public hearing is now open and we'll have a presentation followed by an opportunity to ask questions and provide comments on this matter. If you'd like to speak, please fill out a speaker slip um, and turn it into the city clerk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our demographer, Dr. Justin Levitt of the National Demographic Corporation. So welcome. Thank you, Mayor Ritter, and thank you to all of you who've shown up tonight on this very uh, special meeting um, and taking time out of your day to participate. Um, I'm gonna mention a couple things as we get started here, um, looking, at, looking at the schedule. Um, just about what the purpose of tonight's meeting is what, and what we're hoping to get out of tonight's meeting. Um, so, you know, we had our three public hearings um, or three, three community forums on April 29th across the city. And this is the first of two meetings where we're really coming as a sort of a special meeting in front of the council. The purpose of tonight's meeting is not to pick a final plan. And I want to make that very clear to everyone listening um, that we're not expecting you to say this is the map we want tonight. Um, but, you know, one of the great things is that we have received 18 maps from members of the public, complete full population balanced maps. In addition, we have received another eight proposals or seven proposals, either single district proposals or non-population balanced proposals. And so we have a lot here tonight to look at and to really try to understand what it is, you know, what it is we want to see in the city. So hopefully we're going to be narrowing it down tonight to some representative maps. And we're going to be talking about some of the criteria, hopefully, to think about how we might select those maps. Um, now, one of the important things I want to mention is, you know, we're going to hear about different criteria. And different people might put valuation on different criteria. You know, and I really want to under, make sure that that's something we, also, we all understand, especially when we start talking about communities of interest. Because we all live in different parts of the city, because we all come from different communities, we might have different ideas about what works and what doesn't work. And we need to be able to understand that and respect that as part of making the selection process. Um, so with that being said, you know, this is the first of two council hearings before the selection of a draft map. The next one will be May 30th. And then on June 13th will be a council hearing um, at which the council could potentially adopt or introduce an ordinance to and with a vote of four or with, with four votes, adopt a resolution. If that doesn't happen, then we might need to go to another meeting on June 27th, but that's only if required. Uh, the first two elections plus the mayoral election will be held November 2018 and on November 2020 will the remaining two districts will be held. And sequencing is something, uh, sequencing is a term we use to refer to the order which seats are up. That's something we're going to be looking at as part of this decision making process today. The government code gives city councils complete discretion over how they assign seats to years. So, what criteria are we going to be discussing tonight in terms of what makes a plan viable, what makes a plan not viable? Well, the first constraints we operate under are federal requirements. The first federal requirement is equal population. That's total population. Everybody who lives in a district, including children, including non-citizens. Actually, I always like to say this, including people who are staying at a hotel on April 1st, 2010. And that April 1st, 2010 date, that's the, the date of the 2010 census. 
Even though we know Vista has grown since 2010, we have to use 2010 population data for, the Fed, for this population requirement because that's the only data we have at that precise level of detail. Um, so uh, when we talk about deviation, the courts do allow us to deviate somewhat from perfect equality. You know, congressional districts have to be perfect. But city council districts, they recognize that it's in the interest of a city council to keep neighborhoods together, keep communities of interest together. And so what they do is they set this 10% maximum deviation standard. Anything below 10% is presumed to be acceptable. Um, and so the closer we get to zero doesn't necessarily make a plan any better. In fact, sometimes it could make a plan worse because to get closer to zero would mean dividing up a neighborhood or not keeping a community together. Um, and so, you know, and especially in a city where we know there's growth and we're trying to look at where the growth has been, this is one reason why we might want to not have perfect equality between districts. The other federal requirement we have to look at is the Federal Voting Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this requires that we look at protected class communities to see whether or not they have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. And so that's going to be something we talk about throughout the, throughout the conversation here. The courts do not allow for race to be the only reason or the primary reason for justifying a district. Um, however, we have to consider options in which protected class citizens would be able to influence or potentially or uh, potentially you know, influence the outcome of the election. Uh, and so we'll be talking about that as we go through the different plans. Um, in addition to this, the state also looks at cr traditional criteria. These are both set out in the government code as well as in numerous court cases in front of both the California and U.S. Federal Supreme Court. Uh, and these include criteria such as compactness and contiguousness, both of which refer to the shape of the district. Does it follow regular boundaries when possible? Does it um, follow visible, natural, man-made boundaries, whether it's freeways or major roads, rivers, canyons, you know, features that really serve to create distinct neighborhoods and communities? Um, in addition, contiguity is the principle that you should be able to travel from one part of the district to every other part of that district without leaving the district. And I can already tell you that there are certain parts of Vista where that's just simply impossible. And so we look at the shortest route. You know, what near, how, how would you get to that neighborhood that's not connected except by going through the unincorporated areas around Vista? Um, in addition, we also look at planned future growth. One of these, you know, especially doing this so close to the next census, you know, we have to consider what areas have changed since 2010. Also, respect for voters' wishes and continuity in office. The voters elected a city council, and so one of the things we look at as part of this overall picture is, is respecting the voters' wishes and not intentionally gerrymandering districts or you know, creating districts that pit can, uh, current members head-to-head -head just to do that. And finally, we look at communities of interest, which is probably one of the more complex criteria. Um, I kind of like the way that they described it in the city of San Diego um, with this notion of shared problems. And I'm trying to pull up the slide here. There we go. Um, the communities of interest don't have a precise definition. Like I mentioned, we all think about this differently. But in general, it refers to things that tie neighborhoods together, shared school districts, shared um, attendance areas, shared you know, um, commercial districts, shared streets, because if you're going over a pothole, people driving down that same street are also going over that pothole. If you have a light out in your neighborhood, other people are also seeing, suffering from that issue. If your kids are walk, crossing a particular crosswalk to get to campus in the morning, everyone in that area is affected by it more than people who live in the rest of the city. And that essentially really gets at the heart of this communities of interest. They're things that create connections between people who live close to each other. Um, areas around parks and landmarks and things like that, freeways. And I say sometimes these, sometimes a freeway could serve as a dividing line. Sometimes it serves to bring neighborhoods on either side together. It really depends on the city. You know, I've been to over 50 cities and each one has a different set of communities of interest that we have to talk about. 
Um, and so part of the purpose of those meetings on April 29th was to start the discussion about the communities of interest here in the city of Vista. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Now, just to briefly summarize some of the core demographics that we're looking at in the city, the city had 90,000, there are 93,834 residents according to the 2010 census. This means that each district has to have about 23,500 people. Um, and so this is, you know, one thing that we've looked at and on all the plans that we'll show you tonight have that 10% deviation. Um, and we'll let you know when the plans do not meet that criteria. We've worked individually with certain, with members of the community trying to bring that number down if their initial plans were above 10%. Um, in addition, one of the things to highlight is that the total population of Vista in 2010 was 48% Latino, but the citizen voting age population was 60% white, non-Hispanic white. This is something we see very common across the state, across the country, because the Latino community is younger and less likely to be citizens than other groups, then there's often this gap between total population and citizen voting age. When we talk about the Federal Voting Rights Act, we're looking at this citizen voting age population number. The courts call it the eligible voting population. Uh, and so that's what I'll refer to when I talk about the percent Latino, because as will be very obvious, you could have a majority Latino seat by total residents. That actually isn't a majority Latino seat or even a plurality Latino seat when it comes to eligible voters. Um, in addition, on the right-hand column, just highlighting some of the other criteria we've used in this process, including the age and demographic breakdown of the city, um, where English or other languages are more likely to be spoken at home, education levels, income differences, and differences in housing, single family versus multifamily housing, renting, renters versus owners, and so on. Um, these are just, you know, these are just some of the criteria that often come up in discussions of communities of interest and that we've looked at. Um, and we can see in terms of this Veg Voting Rights Act, we have the Latino population thematic on the screen here. The pink and yellow areas are over 75% Latino, or over two-thirds Latino uh, in the yellow. In the purple and blue, we have under one-third Latino. Um, so, and we see that there is a geographic concentration in the northeast part of the city, and that's something that the plans that we're looking at are going to you know, going to, going to respect to some degree. Um, is it, you know, we look at whether it's possible to draw a majority Latino seat. Um, now, we've already seen these at the public hearings, the green draft um, and the purple draft. Uh, one of the things that I'll mention from last time is one of the biggest things we used in drawing this was looking at the school district boundaries, where the attendance area, well, not, not the attendance areas, but the trustee areas adopted by Vista Unified. Um, I think one of the comments we got several times at our, in our meetings in April was that that may be not necessarily appropriate in all cases. Um, and so, for example, we have in the green map a little portion of District C that goes below the 78 freeway. And I think one thing we heard is that that might make sense for some reason in the attendance area boundaries or the um, the trustee area boundaries for the school district, it really didn't make sense for the city. And so, you know, for example, if we were to move forward with the green map, one thing that I would suggest doing is altering it so that that area would be in District D. Um, but the other criteria we look at, for example, in this map, District A has a majority Latino population, 50.3% Latino by eligible voters. Um, and so, we also, you know, and so we also use some of the other criteria in drawing this map to give you this option. Um, the purple map also is, you know, has a fairly different um, option where we don't have that crossing of the freeways. Um, but again, you know, we heard a lot of comments about how following the school district lines, especially, for example, in this map, the boundary of District C, which is determined in both the north and the west side by the school district boundary may not be the most appropriate to use. And I think that's something we've seen in a lot of the public maps. You know, I want people who made the maps to come up and present their own. And so I don't want to speak on behalf of them, 
We have all of these original submissions on the website, drawvista.org, so you can see the comments that they left when they submitted the map. Um, and I do want to highlight Dr. Christensen, who presented us with eight different draft proposals. Um, so lots of options to consider going through this process. Um, and one of the things we'll ask Dr. Christensen and everyone else to do is if they've submitted more than one map, what is their preferred map? What is the map that they would like to see move forward through this process? Uh, we've also seen maps like the S. Spinks map, where we had four residents submit the same map. S. Spinks was just the first person, first person we received this map from, but we also received it from three other individuals as well. Um, so we have everything from very similar plans to the ones that we presented to plans like the V. Henry plan that look very different, having a sort of district along the eastern side of the city. Um, we also, like I mentioned, had one district plans as well as six plans that were not population balanced. Um, and I want to point out, we, these, most, many of these came from the Universidad Popular program at Cal State San Marcos. And, we're really glad to see them get involved in this process. They had 10 different people who submitted maps um, and five different proposals between them. Now, in order to just start to begin to compare some of these criteria for you, uh, we've put together like a small little summary table. Um, you know, we want to add to this over time. So, you know, we want it to reflect some of the things that you want us to look at in these maps. Um, but I just wanted to highlight, especially in terms of the Voting Rights Act, one of the things we've done is we've noted the five plans that we've received so far that do not have a district in which Latinos make up the largest percentage in at least one district. No plurality Latino or majority Latino seat. Um, we wanted to highlight that for you because that could potentially raise some legal flags in the future. Um, in addition, we've mentioned which council members might be paired in order to present you with um, some draft sequencing options for the different plans. Um, we don't want to get too focused on the sequencing at this point because we have too many proposals to really get into the nuts and bolts. Um, but state law AB 350 requires that we put together what potential sequences we could have. And you'll note that many of these plans offer at least two if not four or five, four, three or four different ways of aligning the districts to election years. So with that, you know, um, with our discussion comes up, as we always say, the more specific you can get, the better. The more references to particular neighborhoods and communities. I think that residents of the city did a wonderful job at the three public forums we had in April actually talking about neighborhoods and communities, people mentioning specifics like the Breeze Hill school area, um, people mentioning specific streets like whether or not Civic Center Drive serves as a major road to divide neighborhoods. Um, and so we would encourage people to continue to give as much specifics as possible. As we mentioned, our next meeting is on May 30th. So if you have any additional maps or additional things you want to submit, we need to have them to National Demographics or to the city by the 22nd because AB 350 requires a one week posting for the council to consider any of your options. Um, if, you know, if you're starting with one of these existing 18 proposals, we encourage you to just tell us, you know, I want to start with this one because with so many different options, it might be easier to just say, let's start with this and see how we can modify it rather than starting from scratch. However, if you want to start from scratch, we still have public participation kits available, both paper here tonight as well as online at our website, drawvista.org. On drawvista.org, we also have all of the maps we have here tonight, um, including the original submissions, the PDFs, and all the demographics attached to that. Uh, we also have an online web viewer where you can search for particular addresses and locations and see where that address would be in each of the different proposals, turning them on and off. So with that, we also uh, one last thing I'll mention is that on drawvista.org, we also have a comment form where you can send us feedback on any aspect relating to this process, the districting process, which maps you prefer and why. And we're happy to take feedback in any language you care to submit in. You know, we'll get it translated and provided to council if necessary. 
So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from everyone tonight, answering your questions. I have actually I have two speakers. Do you want to hear the, the speakers first? I just have a couple of questions okay, for the demographer, if that's okay. Um, I know that a lot of other cities have also started the same process, and I know that your company is very busy working with other cities. And I don't know if you can say or not, but is Oceanside also a city that you're working with? So we, I, I think we're working with the school district, Oceanside Schools. I but think not the city of the Oceanside. The city of Oceanside is working with a different demographics firm. I ask that because I happened to be at a meeting regarding districts and the Oceanside presentation was given and they talked about, we've, we've talked about the 10% variance from district to district. And that presentation from that demographer was very specific on a 5% variance. And so I was a little bit confused as to the discrepancy between the two. Can you address that at all? Yeah. Um, it used to be 5 Oh, okay. I mean, And then the you, law changed and made it What 10. happened is that the Supreme Court ruled about three years ago that anything under 10% was presumptively constitutional. They threw out a plan that was, um, they, or they said that a plan that was about 6 0.2% off um, was not subject to the same or was not subject to different review than it would have been if it was under five. Okay. Um, back in the 2010 redistricting, as a result of many of the cases in the last decade, we were all recommending stay under 5%. Okay. Um, you well, know, that, the, that's, that's good. So. Thank you. And then the second uh, question I had for you is we've talked about protected classes. Can you identify what the law states a protected class is, because I know there's a list in the California Voter Rights Act that lists out and identifies all of the protected classes. Would you be able to tell us what those protected classes are? Well, you know, in, in, terms, of, in terms of what we're looking at, we're often looking toward the Federal Voting Rights Act in particular, not just the California Voting Rights Act. Sort of like once you make the decision to move to districts, mm -hmm. you fall under that federal Section 2 guideline. So can and you tell us what the federal, federal law says protected you know, classes are? It's groups are? that have historically faced challenges or barriers, discriminations to registration or voting, or obtaining materials in their language. Um, and so it doesn't list specific ethnic groups. It, okay, I the, thought it did. I thought I saw a report that listed a particular section of the law where it did actually identify what a protected class is under the law, but you don't have that? Well, so my understanding of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, Federal Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. is that it's not specific like that for a reason because they didn't want to exclude groups or they didn't want people to come and say, well, you know, Haitians are not really African Americans who've suffered, and so if we have Haitian community instead of a black and you know an African American community, then they don't fall under it. Okay. Uh, and so the courts have kind of added groups to it over time. Um, a lot of Latinos, for example, did not fall under the initial Voting Rights Act as written in 1965. Um, they were added in the 1970 revision of the, the of it when they added in the language about language minorities um, be, specifically because they had court the courts had ruled in the 70s that they were not included um, now I think the state law you're right is more specific um, but we're, when we're talking about protected classes under the federal law I think they do leave it intentionally they, they use this language of language people who've had trouble obtaining materials in their language for this exact reason, because they want it to apply to Armenian speakers, mm -hmm. even though they wouldn't have predicted in 1973 that there would be a large Armenian population in California today. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Councilmember Aguilera. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor. So I have uh, just a couple of clarif questions for clarification. Um, I believe it's maybe page two or three of the uh, presentation. It talks about traditional criteria for districting rules and goals. And one of the items that you have here says respect for voters' wishes and continuity in office. In parentheses, though, you have avoiding pairing that results in head-to-head -head contests. What is that? Well, you know, so the courts have said that 
you know, the question of whether or not redistricting should, or going to districts, should include um, incumbents, or incumbent locations, or incumbent protection, is not a question the courts want to get into. It's something that they say is perfectly allowable for a jurisdiction to consider. It's a political question. Now, okay, so that's where we start in that. Now, but, you know, we, we, we tend to think, in it, you know, is that when it, comes to re, when it comes to drawing districts, we know that going to districts is tough. It's a hard thing for a city to do, um, especially since residents of the city are used to voting for all five members of the council, and now they're only going to be able to vote for one member of the council and the mayor. Um, and what we don't want to get into during this process, or what we try to, we suggest avoiding in this process, is when we intentionally pit two members against each other for no reason except that we're trying to put two members in the same district. And if that's the only justification for drawing that line that way, then we would tend to suggest avoiding it because that does not allow voters the opportunity to make a decision on whether or not a member of council stays on the council or not. Um, now, you know, that doesn't mean that in all cases every incumbent is going to end up in the same district. And we've certainly worked with many cities where we had, in, you know, in a school district up in the Bakersfield area, we had three board members um, who lived in the same census block. And all three of them ended up in the same district because that's the only way that that logically made sense. That also happened in Chula Vista and Sweetwater, you know, in Sweetwater Unified uh, or in the Sweetwater High School District. Um, they had four board members who lived within a mile of each other, and all of them, this was right before they all resigned, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or were kicked out, but they all ended up in the same, in the same district, That's essentially. Um, and, and so this is, this, is the real, this is the real question. It's like, you know, what happened in a city like Lancaster or Palmdale, which is always the one that we cite, which is the one we go to in this, is the judge intentionally picked a plan that forced all four council members, other than the mayor, to be in the same district with each other. And that was the only justification he gave for picking that particular plan. And that's what we try to avoid, because it's not fair to voters in the city um, to intentionally use the districting process as a way of targeting a particular council member. And that's the difference. If it happens that two council members live in the same neighborhood and it's very close to each other, it's unavoidable, then we would say, you know, then that might be the option that the council needs to consider. Um, but if it can be avoided and not, so, you know, doesn't affect any of the other criteria, then simply putting two members together just to put them together would really kind of be, in a, uh, you know, in some ways, gerrymandering in, in, you know, in, in, another, in another context. Okay, thank you. Um, and that has happened. So uh, my other question has to do with uh, defining communities of interest. And the one I found curious was the ancestry, not race or ethnicity. I thought that was odd. <laughs> well, you know, you know, so the Federal Voting Rights Act, as you mentioned, protects certain groups. Protects what? Certain groups. Lang people who've had difficulty obtaining materials in their language, certain groups that have been discriminated against legally, historically, in terms of registration and voting. But there's also communities that are not protected by the Federal Voting Rights Act that still are, nonetheless, communities of interest. You know, we could have defined neighborhoods like a Little Italy, like we have in San Francisco. Um, in many cities in Orange County, we've dealt with the fact that the census lumps all Asians together into one category when there are serious differences between Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean communities in places like Garden Grove or Westminster. Um, and so when we talk about ancestry, this is the kind of thing we're getting at. Things that do not fall to the level of the Federal Voting Rights Act specific protection uh, because they're using their formulas that set out in federal law, but that still might constitute a particular community or neighborhood. Um, in San Diego, for example, 
um, the issue of Jewish neighborhoods and Muslim neighborhoods came up. You know, neither group has specific protection under the Federal Voting Rights Act, but, you know, there was an effort to keep Jewish neighborhoods together in the La Jolla University City area. Um, and so that's the kind of ancestry or ethnicity data that we would be talking about, or making, distinguishing between, you know, if you had a large Mexican-American community and a large, you know, Guatemalan or Honduran community, that you could have two distinct areas of the city. Um, you know, it doesn't occur so much in Southern California, but if we were in New York City, a lot of these are really big deals. Um, you know, like the, as I mentioned before, Haitians versus African Americans who come from the South. Um, that's often a very political, you know, politicized tension between those two groups. And communities of interest is what really allows us to talk about that in a meaningful way in the districting process. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, that's the last. Uh, uh, Want to go to the speakers? Okay, first is um, Dr. Bob Christensen. Dr. Rob, sorry. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the city council for giving me this opportunity to speak. And uh, I appreciate uh, the effort that individuals exhibited uh, by drawing the maps while attempting to balance all the various uh, variables involved uh, while developing a legally viable map. Um, after reviewing the pertinent rules and regulations associated with this topic and viewing the uh, submitted draft maps. Um, I believe there are only a few maps that completely uh, comply with the criteria, and I will point out the numerous issues that some of the maps, including some of the ones that I submitted, uh, possess. Um, let me talk about the, some of the issues that some of the maps that were um, uh, presented uh, problems that they possess. Uh, numerous communities of interest are divided, and I've provided a written communication to the city council outlining those, and just for uh, brevity's sake, I won't go through all those. Uh, I think second, you have major uh, geographic features that were not significantly used as district boundaries. Uh, number three, uh, some of the draft maps had one or more districts uh, whose populations uh, were significantly above or below the ideal population of the district. And when I mean significantly above or below, I mean a th either a thousand above or a thousand below the ideal uh, number for a district. Uh, there were draft maps that had overall deviations that exceeded 7%. And there were several uh, map districts that didn't appear compact. The, some of the, the points that I pointed out, they may not identify all the issues, but it serves to signal uh, significant items that I think the city council needs to consider before adopting any map. Now, there are two maps, and they happen to be mine, um, that, address the, I think that, that address the criteria developed and approved by the Vista City Council, along with comply with uh, applicable state and federal laws. And those maps are the R. Christensen three and R. Christensen six maps. And I think they uh, meet all the criteria and applicable laws because one, historic ling uh, linguistic and social economic communities of interest are maintained. Uh, two, major geographical features are used to separate districts. Three, districts are within 300 to 500 residents of the ideal population for a district. Four, the uh, overall deviation from both maps is less than 4%. Five districts are compact and contiguous and follow the precedent that the city of San Marcos used to create their districts one and uh, three, which nearly spanned the entire east-west length of San Marcos. And six, the previ previously cited precedent was used to create districts that attempt to mirror Vista's population, total in voting, when possible, and encourage voter uh, participation. So I hope you will uh, consider that feedback and my comments when you uh, consider a map to adopt. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question, Doctor. Yeah. Because I was comparing your two maps, and so I just wanted to know, what was the reason that I only could see one change, and it was like um, right, 
um, in the, on the purple one, and they changed it to blue. It was a little area. I don't have any show you here. Are you talking about the three and six maps? National University area, yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay, so the reason uh, I have two versions of that is that you have like Manzanita, Yetford, that are in that National University area that could be paired with the uh, Mar Vista area, but it's separated by the unincorporated area of Hanalea. And so I provided the map three and map six to give that neighborhood options to either identify with Shadow Ridge or the Mar Vista neighborhood that is east of um, uh, Highway 78. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, then that's all. I guess that's all my questions, unless anybody else has any. Wait. I have a question, and it might be for our uh, good doctor here, but I think one of the things that was mentioned when you were giving your presentation was that you have to be able to traverse the district without going outside into the unincorporated areas. Is that true? Yeah. I, I think and on actually, one of your maps, on map six, right here, the district ends here and then we have unincorporated area and then it picks up again here. Is that something that would be disallowed? So let me, let me address that because it's a very good question and it's not the only map that we see do this. Okay. Um, because I think like one of the concerns that we heard at the last meeting and that's come up in some of these plans is keeping District 4 entirely south, or D I guess, entirely south of the 78 freeway. Um, now. Because, now there's two things we have to consider. First of all, is part of that little pocket is not accessible from anywhere in the city. There actually are several blue streets on the north side of that that you have to go into the unincorporated area to get no matter where you start. Yeah, Manzanita, Yetford. So, so, so under certain circumstances that would be allowed is what you're saying. So you are allowed to cross uh, you know, between the most direct way, if there is, if there's, if that's possible. The problem is that most of that is one block. Most of that's one census block. And part of that census block is best accessible through Sycamore. And part of it is best accessible through the unincorporated areas that connect more with the, the hillside communities. So where do you put it? It sort of is up to you to make this decision. Okay. Um, but it would certainly be legal, especially since it's crossing the county island. Okay. Because what could happen in the future, for example, is if the city of Vista were to annex that land, then it would clearly be contiguous with the rest of Vista. Right. Okay. Um, it's not like that's the city of San Marcos and you would have to cross through San Marcos to get there. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that because I know that was one of the points you'd made earlier. That's Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, and okay. so, and because of the unique circumstances here, then it's kind of a, your choice. Okay, thank you. Okay, that Dr. makes Christensen, sense. Dr. Christensen, thank you. Yeah. You put those a are, lot of work into all these. Yes, yeah. so those are a lot of the questions I have of people. Okay, so um, Chad Spinks. Where is he? Council members, Mayor. Thanks for having us today, and um, I want to commend you guys for uh, coming out to the community. I saw all of you out speaking at the um, special community meetings and um, taking some hard questions from the community, and I commend you on that. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to explain the reasoning behind our map that I drafted with, um, with my wife. and. Basically, just wanted to emphasize the importance of having a downtown district. When we drafted this map, we started from the center, the heart of downtown, worked our way out, doing our best to keep communities that are in relative walking distance of the downtown area, and knowing that the downtown has its own set of needs. I may be biased since I live in the downtown district, but uh, I do feel that it is important to not split it up into four separate districts in the downtown areas. Some of the early draft maps kind of showed. I guess the main issue is, would be, as of now, I, I'm not sure who I would talk to 
on the board if I had an issue. And I do see this districting as a good opportunity to know who my representative is for my district. And knowing that it's not just everybody can pass the buck and say, oh, well, you know, we'll do what we can. I think it's really important to have that person standing up for your community. And working around, we did our best to make the communities that kind of fall in and have the same needs and community. I mean, you've got the C district, which I kind of called a gateway district. You know, it's more of a bedroom community with uh, a lot of businesses along the freeway. Uh, the B section, I kind of call it the foothills. I mean, it's kind of the foothills of the iconic hills that make Vista. And D being Shadow Ridge, Buena Creek area. But, um, you know, I did take a lot of thought into drafting a map that I felt really represented the communities that um, make up Vista. That's it. Thank good, you. A, good explanation. Thank you. Do you have questions of him? Councilman Rigby? No? Okay. okay. Um, our next speaker is Arcela Nunez Alvarez. Good evening. On behalf of our program, Universidad Popular, or People's University, we want to take a moment to thank all of you for addressing some of the concerns that we brought up at the last meeting. And we want to thank you for hosting the community forums which allowed community participation and made it possible for many people who are usually not engaged in processes like this to actually learn about the process and to be very active in providing input in a process like this one. Uh, they were able to learn about demography, about political representation, about voting rights, and most importantly, about community building. As a civics teacher myself, uh, this process was very much aligned with the educational curriculum that we implement with adults. A curriculum that stresses the importance of being civically engaged, of participating and of making our communities better and safer for everyone. So we look forward um, to many more opportunities and just wanted to thank you for hosting a community forum um, at Linda Rhodes Community Center and for providing interpretation. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Councilor Aguilera. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I would also, I would like to thank uh, Universidad Popular for participating. Um, I, I reviewed their maps and I had some questions about their maps. Uh, I didn't, I mean, to me, um, some of these people are the most in touch with the community who were trying to um, assist in this area. And I'd just like to let, know why some of these maps didn't balance. What, what are, you know, you, you don't have to go map by map, but if you could just pick out a couple of maps that to me, by visually looking at them, they look like great maps and they divide the city well, um, but for some reason they don't balance. And I'll mention that it was a problem on all of the maps that we received from them. Um, that they were not population balanced. In particular, District D in the south end of the city is underpopulated in all of their maps. It generally ends at that place where the city kind of squeezes in, and that only is about 80% of a district. 
and so we have to go a little bit farther up. And so that means that they have one or more districts north that are a little bit overpopulated, a little bit too much. Uh, now, I reached out to them once we got the maps, of course, and we sent an email to them thanking them, showing them the draft PDFs and the statistics. And we invite them to continue to work with us for the next meeting. Uh, if they would like to make a proposal that is population balanced, we'd be happy to work with them. Um, if they want to email us in Spanish, we can work with that as well. So um, we really hope that they will continue to refine these plans. Um, we had not heard anything from them before the deadline and we haven't received any reply after the deadline. But um, we did draw all of these in. As you can see here, we have the demographics for all of them, and we would love to continue to work with them. Thank you. Okay, I, do, I, I have no other speakers from the public. And I, do I have any other speakers up here that anybody wanna? No? I, I will make a comment. <clears throat> Uh, the mayor said we didn't have any other speakers from the floor to talk about any of the maps. But I just want to say thank you to everyone who's come out tonight and everyone who participated in the workshops that we did on the 29th and for submitting maps. Um, it took a lot of time and energy on your part to participate in this process. And that is something that I'm very, very thankful that you all took the time out to do. This is not an easy process for our city to go through, but it, it will be a better process having us all working together. So I just want to say thank you very much. And I also appreciate that and because I um, happened to be on vacation and then I came back and I had to go through these maps. but. I wish people would have put notes on there, you know, because I, I, sometimes I look at somebody that did two maps and I wonder, well, why did they change that, that particular part of it, you know? So it would be interesting if people would put their, re I don't know if they can do that, put your reasons down. I, I changed this because whatever the reason was. So um, anyway, so, you know, because I, when I get two or three maps from one person, then I want to know what, 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 you know, like um, Dr. Rob gave us a reason that he did it, but I'd like to know some of the reasons. So. Anyway, but it, it's, it's a tough job, to, and I appreciate everybody that took all the time to do their maps. I mean, they're, these are t a tough job to do. Um, Councilmember Aguilera. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I did have one other uh, comment or question, clarification, however you want to look at it. Um, I think uh, Dr. Christensen and I had this conversation. Um, you know, there's been an emphasis on schools by various people in our community, which would make a lot of sense, I, I think, on the surface. However, one of the things that I started thinking about is that our school district does a lot of busing. So when you look at um, Breeze Hill, for instance, there's a lot of kids that go to Breeze Hill that live on the other side of town. Um, I just found out that some kids in the Warmlands area get bused to Breeze Hill. So, you know, I think the schools probably don't make as much a difference. Well, my kids go to Vista High, and they have friends. They have one friend that goes to Escondido, another friend that goes to Fall, or not goes to, but lives in Escondido and attends Vista High, another that lives in Fallbrook and attends Vista High, others that live in RBV District but attend Vista High and vice versa. So I think the schools have, have really, ha, have not become as, as significant a uh, factor in, in looking at this as they probably used to be. Now, I went to Bo Beer growing up, and when I was just there the other day, I, I noticed that most of those kids all live in that neighborhood, so that would be a, a, one of the unique schools, I think, that uh, is a neighborhood school. But if you look at Vista Magnet, kids are from all over. Um, I have nieces that come from Oceanside to go to Vita. So, you know, um, how are we making that a major factor in these maps, or should we, or should that be something that's... You know, as a starting point for the green and purple maps, you know, especially you know, given that we, that we hadn't received a lot of public feedback beforehand. Uh, I think the thinking was if the, if the school district has gone through the same kind of process of gathering public feedback, perhaps those boundaries reflect in some way community boundaries. Now, 
one thing that I think we really learned going especially to the April 29th meetings was just where that was true and where that wasn't true. And, you know, it, you know, we have the school district trustee area boundaries, not attendance area, but trustee area boundaries available on the website on the online interactive map so that you can see. And you will see that the purple and green maps align fairly consistently in many places with those boundaries. And I think, like, for example, if the council were to move forward with the green map, I would certainly suggest making adjustments based on the testimony that we've received. Because I think you're exactly correct that, you know, sometimes there's issues that affect school districts that don't affect cities and vice versa. You know, whether, whether it's the city of San Diego, which has clusters of schools, and so that becomes a big issue there, but that has no relation to the city's planning neighborhoods, which are a big issue in the city. Or, you know, but at the same time, there are certain issues with especially communities, maybe it's Bovier here, where a lot of students walk to school or get bus to school and so or have their parents drive them to the same school. And so they do have the same city issue of a pedestrian crossing or a particularly dangerous train crossing that the city would be involved in. So I think for most cities, it is something that can be discussed, especially in that neighborhood context, but where and when, and I think here we're seeing that it's not the primary consideration we're hearing. Okay. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that's uh, contributed. Um, I think we've got a lot of good feedback, and I appreciate your hard work. Uh, the harder you guys work, the less we have to do our own map, so this, this is perfect. Thank you. Councilmember Green. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, once again thank everybody, uh, you know, for showing up and doing your doing your work here. I know this is tons of work, and uh, as a council, we have a lot to digest. Um, you know, everybody has their different neighborhoods in mind, and that's kind of what this is all about: is making sure that you guys are properly represented. So I'm excited to review everything. I'm excited to contact people who weren't here who submitted maps that I have questions for, and uh, you know, based off of the first two maps that you gave us, you know, as far as the green and the purple goes, I do think that you're right. That green map, in my opinion, at least is out because I don't like that area on the other side of 78 there so I do like having that division as far as uh, you know between the freeways go between the purple and green maps so for me I'm, I'm not a green map fan personally I, I don't like that Breeze Hill area coming into you know the other side of the 70 I just don't think it makes sense um, but you know there were a lot of good things on all the other maps and I'd like to try to get those all incorporated to present our community with the you know the best option that represents them all properly while not setting us up for failure. <laughs> you know, we want to be beyond reproach by the time we're done with this so we don't have to do it again. So uh, basically, thank you. And no, as a community, we have a lot to digest before we actually come up here and say, okay, these are the ones we're looking at. So I plan on taking the next couple weeks at least to review the information and ask lots of questions. So thank you guys all so much. And seeing no speakers and no other, I would close the public hearing. And um, our next public hearing is scheduled for May 30th. So, uh, but May 22nd is the last date to submit your additional maps. And that is that Monday? What? It's like it's Monday, so the last, so you have to get on them like this weekend or, or um, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and, and submit them by Monday. So, um, and that's important. You can submit them through the uh, drawvista.org website, and um, you can get assistance through our city clerk's office. If you, but although the city's closed tomorrow, but it's open Monday. Yeah, it'll be open on Monday. So, anyway, that's. Uh, so I guess with that, um, should I, are we ready to adjourn? Do you have anything? anything? Right. Nobody I, has anything else to say? Can I ask? Oh, wait. Um, sorry. Go wanna, ahead. <laughs> before we go, I just want to ask if there's any direction or things you would like me to look for or bring to the, the meeting on the 30th, um, you know, in order to help you make this decision, help the community make this decision, um, whether or not there's any additional tests or changes you want me to look into. And not at this point, but maybe we'll, you know, if they have questions, we'll, we'll get it to you. We'll get it to Patrick, the city manager and, and have him get it to you if we have questions. How's that? Okay. Okay. Okay, with that, um, we're adjourned.